Good evening. Uh, first and foremost, I know that I am standing between you and dinner and probably drinks, so I will make this brief. Uh, my name is Darren Thomas, and I'm one of the solutions architects and SE managers at Arista. And really, in working with Broala and, and Bro in general, they asked us to come in and talk a little bit about what we're doing from a tap aggregation standpoint. Um, so first question I have for most people is, how many of you have heard of Arista? Hey, I love a crowd that's actually heard of us. We make great engineering products. Um, we usually aren't very well known, but uh, we've, we've been very focused on building engineering products for the course of the last, really, nine years now. So we started in 2004. Uh, we started building software, and that software was meant to be the most extensible programmable operating system on the face of the planet for the network. And we didn't even know what it was going to run on. Um, and right around 2008, we said, hey, there's this transition in the gigabit to 10 gigabit space. Um, we're going to build a switch, and we'll, but we'll just be focused more on the software side of things. Our customers came to us and said, hey, we want you to build a switch. And so we've, added, we've got about 2,000 customers. We're adding about a customer a day. We've got about 600 employees. We're based out of Santa Clara. And again, our open, extensible Linux-based OS is something that, that we're, it's kind of our crown jewels, right? That's what powers all of what Arista does, is a single binary image across that. And we built some great hardware in addition to that. So today, I'm going to talk a little bit about tap aggregation, but I always like to have an interesting question to start with. Which one of these is longer? I know it's late in the day. The same, you say. Anybody else? Is this crowd interaction time? OK. They're not the same. They're not the same because I changed it. Um, the one at the top is actually 10% longer. The point I'm trying to make is, a long time ago, networking kind of did its thing. And there's all the, on the tap aggregation space, and the networking vendors said, we're going to focus on features. And we're going to want you to lock into that. We're going we're to keep you tied up to our company based upon the features that we create. And it got changed along the way. Instead of being very open, we had this kind of lock-in functionality of the network. Networking started in the, in the Unix revolution, right? That's where we started doing a lot of the networking side of things. But the answer changed. And a lot of people didn't even notice that. So here's some trends that we're seeing from a data center standpoint. You know, 41% server output. Um, bandwidth is, is continuing to increase year over year. 58% core network bandwidth is increasing year over year. And every 18 months, the data center bandwidth doubles. We actually had a customer tell us every 15 months, their data center bandwidth doubles. And so these are just pressures that we're seeing in the data center. And Arista is a data center switch company. That's what we focus on, the data center primarily. 7.7% um, increase predicted growth in uh, 2013 to 2016 in terms of data center growth. 90,000 square foot average data center and 8kW per square or per rack. Actually, customers are telling us they're running 10kW per rack. I don't know how many of you are in the server space, but the reality here is things are continuing to grow and grow rapidly. You know that data continues to grow along with this. One second of missed packet visibility at 10 gigabits is about 30 million packets, right? We're running 40 gig and 100 gig networks today. Do the math. Right? Go to your auditor and try to explain to them from a, you know, a HIPAA standpoint or some sort of an auditing standpoint, I lost 30 million packets. I only had one second of outage. Right? The reality here is the tools and the monitoring capability, the, the ability to get packets and get information to these tools just haven't kept pace. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about Bro is they're coming at this a different way. And Arista came at the networking market in a very different way. We are focused on using kind of merchant silicon. We're focused on an open and extensible operating system, right? Much like Bro is focused on this openness, right? Starting from that and growing from that and scaling very, very well. I, I think the cool thing for us is, is for us to be involved with people like Bro and people like you because that, that innovation, that, that energy around that movement is just, uh, is just un, un, overwhelming. So, Networks don't look like this up in the corner. I don't know how many, how many of you have a data center that's still got a few towers in it and looks like an old rusty thing that you know, just sits over there on the side. That's not what they look like today, right? It's rows and rows and rows of equipment. Um, we went from very low speed, solidary applications, right? limited regulation, few interdependencies. I came from a company, happened to be a large insurance company up the road, you can figure out which one it is, um, where we had 25 different services would be touched in order to change your address, right? The, the reality of the world today is that it looks more like this, right? We have convergence, we have IP, um, IP telephony on our networks, we have storage on our networks, we have virtualization, which is kind of the networking guy's nightmare, right? <laughs> it's just take everything and let's pack it all up in a little box and still, still you need visibility to that, right? 
We have mobility. I, kind of the scary thing is that today application can exist on one server here and tomorrow it can exist over here and you still have to be able to track that and understand where it's at. And oh, by the way, it's still the network team's fault whenever something breaks, right? So I, I know many of you are probably in the security space. You get blamed right after the network get blamed. So just, just remember that. <laughs> um, and then we have this very distributed applications and, and on top of all that, regulation and recording continues to explode. In addition to all this, how many of you have heard of VXLAN? Okay, a few of you. VXLAN fundamentally is an overlay network, right? It's like MPLS, only in a very different way in the data center. The overlays are coming, right? We're going to have physical networks, we're gonna have logical networks, we're going to have overlay networks, and we expect the visibility to be the same in these overlay networks as what we have in the physical networks today. That starts to be a real interesting problem for us from a networking standpoint and from a security standpoint. And so all of this is kind of changing. All of these trends are changing in the data center today. And the data center really hasn't changed dramatically for the last 10 to 15 years. I mean, I can remember back when I got my CCIE many, many moons ago, and I'm still largely the same things existed that were on the CCIE exam you know, 10, 15 years ago, right? The legacy data center model is, you know, Typical three-tier design. Um, we, we're always looking for a new fabric. I swear if we have another fabric enter the market, I'm just gonna scream, right? Everybody wants their new proprietary fabric because proprietary fabrics equal lock-in, right? So everybody wants you to implement their fabric because then you can't use anybody else. And then we have this large amounts of oversubscription in the three-tier model. If you look at the networking space in general, it's bandwidth constrained, it's not very scalable. Vendors love to lock you into their models. We don't have a whole lot of third-party integration. Go try to figure out how to integrate to a third-party CLI. No automated deployment. We're still configuring networks with config T and or whatever you have in from a Juno standpoint. Monitoring's trivial. It's complex and costly, and there's not a lot of innovation, right? We jokingly say, when's the last time the network did something to make the network operator's job easier? It doesn't happen a lot. And there's the advent of, of SDN. You all know what that is, right? Sales defined networking. That's what the you know, sales guys come up with some way to figure out you know, to sell you something new. But software defined networking or SDN is, is something that's pushing this innovation space. The scale changes everything. And so when you think about it, what, what we're here to talk about today, some of you may never have these problems, and I, I fully understand that. Some of you may never need to, to inspect hundreds of gigabits of traffic. Some of you may never even need to expect, inspect 40 gigabits of traffic. What we're gonna focus more on is kind of how do we look at the tap aggregation space and how do, we, how do we take lots of data from lots of different sources and get it back to a common place so that we can analyze that. I saw earlier, actually, I was thinking about this slide and I'm thinking, I'm gonna show them a slide of a packet capture and they're gonna go, hey, I know exactly what that says, <laughs> right? But the reality is, for most of us, right, this doesn't tell us a whole lot. You all have bosses that want pretty graphs, right? You all want pretty graphs. They want some way to say, you know what? This is bad, right? This peak here is bad. Something happened there. That's bad. So we've got to find a way to move from this kind of textual-based information where I get a ton of text, and I've got to move it into getting to where it's pretty and actually actionable at the end of the day. That's what we're trying to get to. So how do we monitor today? Many of you today probably have, you know, a single point, right? It's reactive in many cases. When you have a problem, we go plug into the switch and we monitor via the switch via that point, right? It's a typical needle in the haystack. We like to use the words such as, let me know if it happens again, right? That's usually the problem we run into from a reactive monitoring standpoint is we have to wait for it to happen again. Some people have started to use S-Flow. It gives you this very coarse view of the network. It's very metadata-ish, right? Many of the switches support S-Flow or NetFlow. And so you kind of get this coarse grain view. And again, it's not a whole lot more cost. So if you're following the orange line, it's not a whole lot more cost to implement this coarse network flow analysis. But you don't really have any deep analysis in that space. So you're not going very deep in the package. And then I think this is where Bro and, and others come in. It's just kind of this full out of band where I'm capturing the packets. I'm capturing every last bit of information that's going on between the conversations. It's fully out of band. It's very usually expensive from a, cop a CapEx and OpEx standpoint, and often it's proprietary and closed. In order to implement this, you usually have to go to some sort of a matrix switch vendor. 
that likes to charge an exorbitant amount of money for you to have the 10 gigabit capability. So for us, there's really these three sources, these three pieces to tap aggregation. There's sources, optical taps, or electrical. How many of you come off of uh, just a typical span port in your environments? A lot of you. How many of you use optical taps? Uh, that seems to be the, the common method. Most people don't, don't trust span ports these days, and they end up using optical taps. And then you've got the aggregators of these matrix switches. Gigamon, VSS, Anui, Arista, those types of companies. And then obviously up the tool side of things from a, and this is where Bro and other from an APM standpoint play. This is an interesting picture because um, actually I'm talking to a lot of universities about this. They want to take, if you think of these slices as buildings throughout their campus, they want to be able to put optical taps between the buildings or within the buildings and aggregate that information back up to a common device and then span that or load balance that across a number of tools. And that seems to be one of the common things that we see application for our switches is to be able to take optical taps, aggregate them to a device, and then use symmetric hashing, in our case, to get off to the different tools to split up the load across the cluster. So what's wrong with this picture? Right? Today we have proprietary solutions that are complex, they're independent, they don't, have a lot of limit, or they don't have a lot of viable usability associated with them. What do you do with a one gig sniffer or one gig tap port when you're moving to 10 gig or 40 gig? And they're very high cost. And so this was kind of the way we looked at it from a tap aggregation standpoint is the, these are the problems, right? And we're a networking switch vendor. But if you think about it, what tap aggregation really is, is a switching of packets, moving of packets from one location to another, but being able to do it in a very proactive manner, being able to always have that on so that you can now add value to your various businesses or consumers. And so we want to get to kind of this model, right? Where we, as the networker security team, can call the server guys or gals and say, hey, guess what? Last night we caught some problems. You might have had some problem with, data, with some data migration going on last night. And we know that there was a DDoS attack internally launched. We captured it via Bro. And we actually deployed ACLs through the API to the Arista devices to block the DDoS attack before it really caused a whole lot of damage. Right? Today, we're usually in a reactive position. We want to be in a more proactive position. And that's really our vision for where Arista is at in terms of the overall TAP aggregation space. We want to introduce the commodity economics. Arista is built on merchant silicon. We're built on silicon today, built from Intel or Broadcom. By the way, they can make better silicon than anybody else on the planet. That's what they do as a for their livelihood, right? So we use merchant silicon. We don't have a lot of licenses. We have one license for our switches. We take all these high-end features. Now, I'm not going to tell you that we do everything that some of our competitors do. But the reality is, how much is everything worth to you? Right? I had one competitor that came to us, or one customer that came to us, and they said, I need to provide this number of tap ports. Here's the, here is the quote I got from your competitor. It was 150 grand to provide a tap aggregation solution. In fact, the, the cost of the tap aggregation solution was so much, there was no money left for the analysis tools. <laughs> right? That's usually what we run into. We, we have analysis tools vendors come to us, and they say, hey, um, we don't have any money left for the tools if we do the tap aggregation. Our solution was 15 grand to provide the same solution as our competitors. We introduce what I call Ethernet economics. Right? Our switches are switches, they're switching traffic. There's nothing in terms of, there shouldn't be anything special in terms of moving traffic from a port to another port, being able to take that traffic and um, replicate it out from one port to multiple ports. And we also have APIs, the universal OS based upon Linux, un underneath running all of this. So this is really what tap aggregation is the Arista way, right? We could do tap aggregation for 100 meg up to 40 gig today. Um, for those of you that have 100 gig, we actually are enabling tap aggregation functionality on our chassis-based product, which will give us 100 gig functionality towards the end of this year and early next year, right? So if you have 100 gig needs, we have a, a chassis product that will provide that. We provide precision, precision hardware time stamping. On ingress to the device, we can stamp the, the packets via hardware without taking a hit. Right? All of our switches are line rate non blocking. We can give you flow analysis using things like S flow 
Um, we have common equipment across all of our, our products. So we have one RU switches. In the future, we'll have the chassis-based solution. And then you get into the traffic filtering, slicing, load balancing, et cetera. <clears throat> one of the things that we've had customers come to us and say is, <clears throat> I just need generic traffic filtering right, on ingress and on egress. Or if I want to have, maybe I'm watching my traffic all the time and I want to be able to slice a piece off because I want to do some extra special forensic analysis on a sm few smaller conversations, we provide that functionality through slicing. And then the load balancing piece. So the universities have been most interested in this, and actually Seth and I were talking about it out in the hallway. One of the things that we have customers come to us and say is I have a 100 gig exit or I have even multiple 10 gig exits from my environment. Well, how do I find a tool that can allow me to scale to, or an analysis tool that scales to 100 gig? Right? They generally don't exist today. Now you can use clusters, and that's where Bro starts to come in. But now how do I funnel that data to those clusters? And so we have this functionality called symmetric load balancing. And what it is is a five-tuple hash, basically. And where we will say, my conversation to you and your conversation to me, we will always make sure it hashes onto the same link. So I basically can create an ether channel of links to a Bro cluster. right? And I can do 16 ports in that link today. And I can distribute traffic based upon conversation out to all 16 of those links. And this has been the kind of the primary application for what people have come to Arista for in terms of tap aggregation in that environment. We have microburst detection. One of the other things we hear customers say is, I get a sudden burst of traffic coming through my tap aggregation device, and I drop packets. I'd sure like to know when that happens. And I'd also like to know what packets I actually were, were going on in the wire at that point in time. We have the ability on our switches to provide nanosecond resolution based upon microburst detection. Right? We have an individual switch can go from 0 to 30 million packets per second in under a second. And so if you think about that, we have to watch kind of that buffers. And we have something called LANs, which provides the micro, microburst detection analysis and capture so that we can capture when we see that burst or we can capture when we see that watermark on that on that individual port going above a certain threshold. Kind of the other interesting piece is we have open APIs, RESTful APIs. We have a fully functional CLI, and we can also run Python directly on the device. And so we were talking about, um, in, in our environment, and I don't know if this is your case in, in your environment, but I've had customers come to us and say, you know, I've got these long-lived flows, and I've got, let's say I've got uh, 10, 10 gig of capacity in my bro environment. And I've got some long-lived flows. And those long-lived flows are running 3 to 4 gig at any point in time. So I've got long-lived flows coming in the device. That the Bro device or the Bro cluster is having to analyze those long-lived flows all the time. Well, if I've, once I've analyzed it and I know that that flow is good, do I really need to sit there and continue to analyze it if I know it's a long-lived flow? So we've talked about the functionality where once the Bro device or the Bro cluster has analyzed the flow. It has said, this is a good flow. We can actually send through the API back to the Arista to say, you know what? Put an egress filter on this flow. I don't want to see it anymore. I don't want, I, I don't want to see any traffic from that flow from that point for, for, based upon a specified time period. And then we can watch the counters on that ACL. And when we see them drop to 0, we can remove the ACL. And the next time it comes up, I'll do the analysis on it again. If I determine that it's a long-lived flow and it's an extra large flow, again, I can institute the ACL back on the switch, specified time period, remove the ACL. So it gives me a lot better scalability in my environment so that I'm not kind of analyzing the same thing that I know is already good or know that already is bad. Um, and then on top of all this, this is all done on our standard switches. You can either put the switch into a full-on tap aggregation mode, which basically every port becomes a tap or tool port. Or you can run the switch with the standard monitor ports and provide the majority of these feature sets and make it a standard Mac-based forwarding switch. So we're not doing anything fundamentally different. right? We're just forwarding packets through the switch. We're replicating packets in the switch. And that's another good example that has been a common use case is customers come in and they have maybe five sets of tools that they want to send the data packets to. But I have one source. So how do I get to five different tools with one source? Well, I got to replicate the packets somewhere. We could do that on our switch, again, at line rate, out to the, all, up to the number of ports that we have from the tool standpoint. So this is how we focus on tap aggregation the Arista way. You know, aggregation is just one component. It's really just as advanced tap functionality. But we deliver kind of the 
end-to-end -end flow visibility, the integrated real-time performance, risk-based monitoring, and it's all done on this standard Linux-based operating system and standard hardware with, with open APIs. So you can move from this kind of integrated fine and coarse monitoring, right, using S-Flow and standard you know, burst analysis with LANs. With a small incremental investment, you can get some more aggregation by leveraging some of the tap ag functionality. And then you can move to a full out-of-band environment with common equipment, leveraging Ethernet economics without much incremental cost here. And so that was really kind of the idea behind when we released the tap aggregation functionality is how do we get to this without seeing that huge hockey stick in your cost at the end of the day. So we introduced the commodity economics. Um, we can do 100 gig to 40 gig today. Like I said, we'll be able to do, uh, or 100 meg to 40 gig today, we'll be able to do 100 gig in the future. I talked a little bit about the operating system, the APIs. And this is just a straightforward approach. You can move from an in-band approach to an actual out-of-band approach based upon your needs and your various environments. So for us, this is how we build our operating system. It's a non-modified Linux kernel based on Fedora. We have SysDB, which does all of our state separation between our kernel and our agents. And then we build agents across this. It's the most modular, most programmable operating system today that is on the planet from a networking standpoint. We can build more agents, and this is where the extensibility comes in. None of these agents talk to one another. They all talk through SysDB. So it's a fundamentally different way to build software. We take this great software, and we overlay it on really two sets of devices for tap aggregation today. We can give you 24 to 64 ports in a 1RU switch, or we can get up to our chassis-based product, which will do 9,600 gig ports, 288 40 gig ports, or 1,152 10 gig ports, all line rate non-blocking. And we will enable the tap aggregation functionality on this towards the end of the year, first part of next year. I know, Chief, back there smiling. So um, that's something that's coming in that chassis. The hardware supports it. It's just a matter of us enabling the software on it. Okay, So we can make this a reality. We can take your network today. We can aggregate traffic off of span ports, or if these are Arista switches, we can actually go directly to an aggregator. But if not, we can come off span ports, aggregate it up, hardware timestamp the traffic, backhaul it via 40 gig links to an aggregation device or a tool device, and then split it off with symmetric hashing to any number of tools, leveraging the replication in the hardware, leveraging the symmetric hashing in the hardware, leveraging the filtering in the hardware. And we can do that all today, and we can do it from an Ethernet economic standpoint in a much more cost-effective way than what majority of the TAP aggregation vendors will do. And that's fundamentally able to be done today, and we're not going to compromise the visibility. We're going to allow you to increase your network speeds without compromising that visibility um, that we all need. That's what I got. Questions? Yes? Do you guys have any plans to go with uh, an inline version, like the VSS protector? Not that I'm aware of. So I'd have to I'd have to look, and I'm not as familiar with the VSS protector product um, in general. But basically, running it, running VSS, running capabilities right on the switch itself. Yeah. So I mean, we're there's two components to any of our switches. There's the control plane, and then there's the data plane forwarding. And so the control plane being a standard AMD or Intel processor, and then our, our data plane is going to be based upon the Intel or Broadcom chip. What we can run on that chip is usually dictated by the capabilities as, as the silicon spun up. So um, we were talking, one of the other things I usually get questions about, so I'll just hit it, is deduplication. We do not do, not do packet dedupe. Um, in order to do that, you have to have an FPGA. And in order to have an FPGA, it's very expensive, right? So um, again, it's not the right solution for everybody, but then again, you know, I think you have to weigh out the costs of what if I handle dedupe in the, in the analysis engine versus dedupe in the network engine. So I'll, have to, I'll do some looking on that, but I haven't heard anything about that, and I, had, I know of no plans in that space. Other questions? I know there's one more in the back somewhere. Yeah, go ahead. Do you plan to support OpenFlow? We do. Um, so, yeah, do we plan to support OpenFlow? Um, actually, today on our 7050 series switches, we can do something very similar to this where we can do direct flow. Um, and you can steer the packets via direct flow or open flow. So if you want to do a big tap application or something like that, you can. Um, after the first of the year, we will support open flow on the 7150. 
The 7150 is an FM 6000 chip from Intel. Um, today our OpenFlow support is mostly on the Broadcom chipset. Um, and then we will um, obviously have that support on the uh, FM6000 after the first video. So, so you can switch. And it'll be a, the other nice thing about the OpenFlow application anyways is um, it's, it's VLAN based. So you can have a switch running some VLANs in OpenFlow, some switch, some VLANs running in standard port forwarding. So yeah, we'll, we'll have that on that device. Other questions? How many of you, I, I talked to a few of you, there's some of you using this, anybody, anybody want to raise their hand that's using an Arista product to do this type of functionality? For a few of you I talked to out there, okay. I guess I, my, my, my closing comment would be, I would encourage you, if you're going down this path of tap aggregation, um, take a look at what your needs are, right? Obviously if you don't have the scale needs, then you, know, you, can, you can handle that usually in a, in a smaller, or handle that from a, even a server standpoint, an aggregation standpoint. But if you're going down that, that path of, I need load balancing across multiple devices, and I need to be able to handle a lot of traffic, I would encourage you to take a look at it. Um, and uh, you know, D2 at aristanetworks.com, you can shoot me a note. Be glad to, to help you guys get some gear and uh, test it out. Um, and uh, we can go from there. But Liam, anything else to add from your perspective? Uh, no, except that the um, the bro uh, pictures that are in the slide deck were not just added for this presentation. Uh, so I've seen this presentation a couple times. Uh, we asked Arista to come; they did not, you know, hunt us down because I really <laughs> think that what they're doing is amazing, and we thought it would be great that other people should hear about it. It fits our model very well, and um, for what it's worth, you know, we actually have ordered a switch to experiment with on ourselves because we think it's the most exciting thing, one of the most exciting things out there. All the things that we've been looking for in OpenFlow are already available today in the Arista platform. So we want to start playing with it and seeing what kind of integrations we can do. So we should be should be getting one for our office here shortly. Yeah. The, um, the, one of the official white papers that Arista is working on for their web page is for a bro-based solution at a major uh, EDU. So uh, the details for that, I don't know when they're going to finish that up, but that was that was how I, I that's how I found out about the project, and I was shocked by the capabilities. There, are there any other questions? I say one of the other cool things, which I'll just challenge you all, is I mean, in terms of the programmability. So we give you direct access to a Bash shell from our switch. Right, you can type Bash, it'll drop you right into a Linux shell. We expose all the interfaces via the kernel. I won't say that we have all the answers for what that means. Right, um, and that's kind of the interesting piece is because actually I was, I was talking with a gentleman here the other day, and he's like, "So I'd like to be able to to block these flows based upon time, and how do I how would I do that? Well, we can call this API. It's all through Python. I mean, there are function there's functional capabilities that we haven't even scratched the surface on that allow us to do you know black holing of traffic or inserting ACLs or redirecting traffic. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of capability in that programmability in that interface that, you know, Arista Warrior, one of the books that's written about Arista, we say, if you want to make your switch a smoldering pile of metal, go right ahead, right? You fundamentally can do that. In fact, we have some customers that have done that. <laughs> not smoldering, but they've actually taken down the device. The reality is we do not want to handicap you from doing what you want to do with your device from a switch standpoint. Yep, we've. Um, that's a great point. Um, from a from a programmability standpoint, or from an extensibility standpoint, um, we have some customers run Puppet. We have other customers run Chef Agents right on the switch. When you bring our switch up, you can drop it into the rack. It won't forward the first packet until it gets its software configuration, software and configuration, and the appropriate agents that it needs. And then you can manage them from that point forward with either Puppet or Chef or CF Engine or NSX, whatever it might be. And that's just fundamentally different for networking than what we've seen the past 15 years. There's others that are trying to do that, but we're, uh, we'll see how successful they are in that space. Yeah, I'm gonna pay Jason later for my... Uh, <laughs> it's a great point, Jason. Yeah. We do, we do have integrated SSDs on the device, and one of the functions that I, that I kind of glazed over quickly is you can mirror packets from the data plane of the switch back to the SSD if you wanted to. Now, you're obviously limited to how much data we can send to the CPU of the device, um, but you can do a TCP dump then on the, on the data back to the integrated CPU on the switch. I think we limit it to seven meg today um, from that device. You can also NFS mount the Arista device to a storage device somewhere else. If you want to push packet information or push log information off, you can do it through an NFS mount. 
See why we like these guys? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, it's, so I, I was from Cisco previously and, and spent some time in the corporate world. And truly, the reason I came to Arista is there's fundamentally nobody else in the industry doing this. Nobody else that's offering this level of programmability to where I can now choose or you can choose to do what you want to do with your device. Not what you're bound by CLI, right? I, I jokingly say we have CLI-defined networks today because you can only do what's defined in the CLI, right? Facebook calls them, you know, what do they call it? CDN, Cisco-defined networks, right? <laughs> so, I mean, you're fundamentally bound by that, and we want to take those shackles off and see where the community goes with it, and we encourage you to, to work with that. Um, so, so having said that, if you're interested, I do have, I can get you an EOS image to run locally in Fusion or VirtualBox. Um, if you just shoot me an email at d2 at aristanetworks.com, I'll be able to enable your download functionality for that. And you can actually run, it's a full image of our operating system. We've just spoofed it to believe that there's actually a data plane when there's not really a data plane, it's just a control plane. The data plane becomes your CPU on your device. Yeah, so we do. So you can, we, we encourage you to run that. It gives you the full API functionality so that you can you know, hit it with RESTful APIs. You can run Python right on the device. I mean, it acts exactly like a switch. <laughs> no, not fully supported in prod. He's been trying. <laughs> but it does give you a, a rich set of functionality for exactly what we can do on the switch. And it's not a, you know, it's, it's not a crippled image, right? It's a full image of what we do. And it runs, that image, by the way, runs across all of our products. It's the same binary image. We don't have different images for different products. OK, right. I think we got time for maybe one more question, or it's about time to wrap it up. OK, well, thank you guys very much. Thank you.